There you go. Looks good. good. Okay. Yes. Sorry about that. Good catch. No yep. problem. <laughs> okay. We ready? Yep. I think so. I think you can go ahead, uh, Steve. All right. Uh, good afternoon. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the March uh, lecture in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. And uh, we're in for a treat today. As you can see on the slide there, we're gonna be hearing from Kirk Dombrowski. Uh, Kirk is the University of Vermont Vice President for Research. Um, but Kirk is also a very accomplished investigator as you're going to hear today. And so I'm proud to be introducing him as not only the UVM uh, VP for research, but also a senior investigator in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. So as you might expect, um, Kirk has a distinguished academic uh, pedigree. He took his bachelor's degree in anthropology from Notre Dame and then moved on to Columbia University where he stayed in anthropology and did his master's degree and then completed a dissertation at the City University of New York, um, also again in anthropology. And um, very exciting when I think back, my, my dissertation was with preschool kids in Lawrence, Kansas and Kirk was off in the small remote Southeast um, villages uh, where of Alaska, where he was um, it, um, investigating indigenous populations there. So um, yeah, he, he does exciting research. Um, so he stayed on at SUNY uh, as a faculty member um, and he joined uh, not only the Department of Anthropology, but also the um, uh, Department of Criminal Justice and it was during that period that he began uh, research on um, HIV infection and the spread of that infection by intravenous uh, drug use or among intravenous drug users. Um, these were seminal studies and many of them were conducted in, in Puerto Rico with a really outstanding team. Um, and he stayed there through the associate professor level, um, but then was lured away to the University of Nebraska in, in the middle, in um, the Midwest, which you know contrasts a little bit with, um, with where he had been up to then, but um, he did a, he was recruited there to lead their um, minority um, disparities initiative um, and did as Kirk is, Kirk is want to do um, many things and included among those many things is he started the Rural Addiction um, Drug Addiction Research Center, which is where I, I first had the pleasure of meeting Kirk. And so he, he did wonderful things there uh, through 2020 when he took the position here at the University of Vermont. And um, I know I, I feel very fortunate to have him here at UVM. And uh, today you'll, you'll hear why. So Kirk, uh, please go forward. And thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, Steve. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah, kind of a varied career. Um, I, I, uh, I started off going to Southeast Alaska uh, as an environmental anthropologist and got there only to find uh, very high rates of suicide and substance abuse. And that kind of as you can do in anthropology, which you probably can't do in a lot of fields. I just changed my dissertation topic on the fly. Um, you can do that because they give you about nine years in anthropology. You wouldn't, they wouldn't tolerate that in most places. But, um, and when I got back to New York, uh, my wife told me I couldn't go live in Alaska for years at a time anymore. I had to be a grown up, And I was very lucky to uh, uh, be able to make connections with um, a very senior researcher named Sam Friedman, who was at the very forefront of HIV research um, in New York City at the time. He took me on. Uh, I essentially uh, went from being a professor to sort of feeling like I was a graduate student again. And um, he introduced me to work that had been going on in Brooklyn. I worked with the Brooklyn AIDS Task Force for a number of years. 
And that was really a, a, a key entry for me. This, the substance abuse connection was there with some of the work I had done earlier. Um, but moving into HIV was, um, was a really big change. And because I was a social scientist, I've been, I've been in departments of psychology, I've been in departments of anthropology and sociology. I, I was very interested in the way that social factors and disease natural history uh, influenced one another. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about that today. I've, I've talked to this group briefly before and I think I did mostly statistics last time. And today I wanna try and talk about why we don't just go and do um, interviews with folks in the field, um, why we don't just bring them into our offices, but why we actually go out uh, and work with them in their homes and in their communities and so on. Uh, because you 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 find uh, you find different things. We don't ever go out and just find what we're looking for. But if you're not looking for it, you won't find it. And so um, so I want to uh, try and try and sort of do some bridge work today between the kind of uh, statistical stuff that's probably more of my better known work uh, with some of the real um, sort of hard, you know back to basics kind of ethnographic work that we also did. And the Puerto Rico project, as, I, as I'll talk about, was really unique in that way. Um, and so I'm, I'm presenting work that was done by, uh, by myself, but also by uh, Elspeth Reddy and Roberto Abadi, both of whom were postdocs who worked with me. And you'll see several other people uh, uh, mentioned along the way and, and members of my team. And, and in part, what I'm really after today is how we combine various kinds of, of um, data around really compelling questions. Um, and this was the real question that we were after in Puerto Rico. Um, and this, you know, Steve and I were just talking about contingency management and, and how do we understand behaviors uh, in the field. And what we were really after there was um, if people understood what, what the risks of HIV and hepatitis C were, did it affect their behavior? And if it did, how did it affect it? How much did they understand? What and, and in what ways did it not affect what they were doing because of the things were involved? So that's sort of the big picture of where uh, this talk is coming from. Um, so, so why study rural drug use in Puerto Rico? Um, well, it, it, beginning in the it, mid-1980s and later 1980s, Puerto Rico became a really uh, significant place in the East Coast drug trade. Um, this kind of timing was partly a transition uh, from a different distribution system in the United States. There were um, mainly uh, an awful much of the import system for drugs, particularly heroin and cocaine in the US and on the East Coast were made by local connections. These were folks who lived in the United States who formed a bridge to um, foreign, uh, at, you know, outside producers of drugs in places like Colombia or elsewhere. In the 1980s, you began to see a kind of middleman operation beginning um, uh, in Mexico that really spread out and covered almost all of the East Coast. It's the system we have now. And we uh, it gets sometimes referred to as a trampoline drug economy. And, and it was different in two ways, I think, than, than the drug economy that preceded it. One was, um, the, the biggest one was that there was a, a large, um, uh, um, role for, for middlemen who were neither in the US nor the drug producers themselves, which is a very different kind of phenomenon. And the second is that they were paying, they used, they began to pay people along the way for the importation progress in drugs. And that was not how things had been done before. So for example, if you're gonna use a small uh, airstrip or a port in Puerto Rico uh, to, 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 uh, to move heroin into the East Coast, um, in the past, you might have paid local people to keep it under their hat in cash. Beginning by the late 1980s, they began paying for these processes in drugs. And that really ramped up local drug use along the pathways of drug importation into the United States. Um, in Puerto Rico, that also combined with gentrification and urban renewal projects that pushed a lot of that did a lot of what was unapologetically referred to as slum clearing. They literally took whole areas of housing, urban housing projects, leveled them, built uh, new tourist economy places, and then built places like I'll show you out in the countryside and just forcibly removed people to the countryside. Um, you put that all together with some of the collapsing economic infrastructure of Puerto Rico um, and, uh, and the dawn of the HIV 
uh, era in, in, you know, in drug use and you have a really uh, sort of a perfect storm for, for problems there. So we pitched this project, I think beginning in 2013 to go there. It was largely driven by some postdocs uh, it, that I was working with at the time in New York City. And we transported this out to Nebraska when I went there. Um, and as I'll show you, we had some really good local partners. We worked with the Department of Epidemiology um, at, uh, at the, uh, the chair there, Juan Carlos Reyes, who's been my research partner for a long time at Puerto Rico Medical Sciences. Um, we work with um, Central, the Central Caribe University School of Medicine um, on some of these projects. And then we had really good relationships with the CDC with Sandra and her team at the Puerto Rico Department of Health. And as you'll see, we started this whole project with a kind of NHBS-like survey and approach. Uh, NHBS is CDC's National HIV Behavioral Surveillance uh, Study. And, and we were able to work with them very closely. Um, and then our most important partner, as you'll see, was El Punto en la Montaña, which is a syringe exchange program in central Puerto Rico. Former student of mine, graduate student, uh, postdoc, um, who helped organize that and was connected to some of the work we were doing in New York City. Um, so I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare for this presentation. All of the support that funded that research was listed on the previous page and is available in the published sources that resulted. We've published about 35 or so articles on this, uh, on this study over the last, say, six or seven years. It's um, fed generations of graduate students and postdocs. And so uh, it's really been a, it was a really successful project from an academic point of view. Um, it was a less successful project um, from, uh, from an intervention point of view. Uh, the situation, I'm, I'm, I just, I wish I could say something different. I really do. But we have not seen significant changes in the drug economy. Um, if anything, the Hurricane Maria, which sort of hit in the middle of all this and Hurricane Irma, um, and then um, COVID and various other things have, um, uh, if anything, made the um, link to care and uh, issues around rural drug use worse, not better in the eight years that we've been there. And there is an R01 study I do with Charles Wood that's still going on uh, right now, the sort of same team. So, so this was the heart um, of where we worked. This is uh, a small town in the mountains of Puerto Rico. We're about at this point about 45 miles south of San Juan. Um, it's not a huge distance. If you're if you can get out of the mountains, you can drive from, um, from Caguas to San Juan in about 35 minutes. Um, but these mountain towns are actually socially extremely isolated. Public transportation is marginal. And the folks who, who live here live uh, in the valleys where, uh, where they live. They're not uh, highly mobile out to San Juan uh, or to even to Caguas, uh, except on occasion. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for uh, the work that we started doing and for where we were. So um, uh, as part of a, a interdisciplinary team in Nebraska, we brought some students down from the College of um, Fine and Performing Arts who were in the film program and they did some uh, early documentary work with us. This is just a short introduction to the project. Let's see if we get volume. Can you hear that, Steve? Yeah. You become somebody's sister, and um, that kind of kinship, right? That you, that, that happens to you. That, that doesn't come by blood. It just happens to you. It hits you. And he's HIV positive and hepatitis C positive, and he was infected when when he was a when he was an injection drug user, and the love of my life, and I love him, and I hate the world because he's HIV positive. He doesn't need it to be. That was avoidable. My name is Camila de Costa, and uh, I am currently an assistant professor. I am also an HIV and drug use researcher who specializes in migrant Puerto Rican injectors. And I am also the co-founder 
of El Punta La Montaña, a rural community change program. Almost half of our constituency of our uh, people we serve are homeless. When you're homeless, we don't trust anybody. It's really hard to get trust, uh, not only from staff to participant, but amongst themselves. So like uh, trying to introduce a new meaning to the word trust in your lives, it's an achievement. It's an achievement because these people only know how not to trust. My role in, 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 in this study is to make sure that there is an entrance. El Punta de la Montaña is who, the only organization that knows how to, be, how to deal with not weak rural injectors. The look change is a, it's a, it's a philosophy. It's harm reduction. It's a way of putting people's health first, regardless of drug use. You know, most people seem to think that you don't deserve care if you're a drug user. I'm trying to undo a, bit, a little bit of that. It gives me goosebumps. It's, it's really bad over here. It's really bad. Okay, whoops, how do I keep going? <laughs> uh, whoop. That's not what I want to do. Okay, so back to uh, back to off the video. This was our uh, research station. And, and as I mentioned before, one of the first things we did was use uh, common recruitment methods that were the same that CDC was using in urban areas and NHBS across the United States and to see if we could do it in a rural area so that we would have a rural sample that looked a lot like our urban samples that the CDC is collecting. We used a very similar questionnaire. We used similar kind of testing regimen and so on. Um, and we did 315 interviews in this office uh, here in a small complex in central Puerto Rico over the course of uh, over the course of about six months, um, the comparisons were pretty useful with the urban uh, drug use. The San Juan and HBS uh, numbers are on the left. The rural sample is on the right, and you can see where we found some significant differences. Are actually our rural population was much better insured um, and had better access to health care than the urban. A population that NHBS had worked with. We had far fewer women in our sample than they did, although um, they also had a predominantly male sample. And um, there were some other, uh, you know, sort of smaller differences in drug use on the whole. Um, uh, there was actually less syringe sharing in the rural areas. And, and that may have had something to do with the fact that we were recruiting in part, uh, uh, our seeds for our study came from um, a syringe exchange. So that's possibly biased some of the data, but um, we don't think it did, but I, I'm open to that critique. Um, and so that was the sort of first wave of the study. Um, and it gave us some baseline data that really allowed us to ask some, some, some more questions. This was a whole series of papers. Um, we found that you know, hepatitis C risk was associated with network size, how many people that, people, uh, that uh, uh, PWID had injected with. Um, we found that HIV was not related uh, to status, to, HIV, uh, to drug user network size. HIV status was not. Um, and we find, found really high levels of um, equipment sharing and low levels of needle sharing, relatively speaking. So we did a number of different studies, um, the sort of statistical analyses of this sample, including latent class analysis and a whole bunch of stuff on risk types um, uh, and uh, uh, treatment trajectories. And those are published in a number of places. Um, but we also um, knew that we were, wanted to do more than just kind of duplicate NHBS. And so we introduced what, what we called, because it's always good to have a flashy name for something, microethnographic assays into the process. And this was, um, we took the usual respondent-driven sampling referral recruitment trees that we had, and we took ethnographers who would pick out randomly folks from, uh, from those recruitment trees, reach back out to them and spend two weeks with them in what, what we uh, in, in social science called focal follows. That is, um, we, we, I guess it's also called deep hanging out. Um, but the, the process is that we 
follow people, work with them, talk with them on a daily basis for two weeks and recruit anyone who would be eligible for our study from their uh, personal networks into, uh, into our study and they would do the same interview. And what we got there was a whole bunch of sort of opportunities for uh, informal conversation, um, uh, you know, um, uh, contextual information. Um, and we got to actually observe the, the networks that we were asking about in the formal interviews. So if you do a sociometric interview, you ask people who have you used drugs with in the last 30 days, and you write all those things down about their relationships and so on. Um, by doing the, the, the microethnographic assays, and we did 31 of them, um, these focal follows, you really got to see uh, the, the networks that we were trying to document um, in the interviews uh, in action. And so that was a kind of a really uh, interesting um, thing that really hadn't been done in any other study before. Uh, on the left, you can see the area of Puerto Rico that we're talking about. Caguas in the center there is sort of a large city and we were in an area called Sidra, which is um, in the mountains. And that's what you were just looking at on the, on the screen. Okay. One other quick video, and then I'll get on to the data. So this is our lead ethnographer. For this project, I had to come here. I just moved uh, in late December. I'll be here for two years and a half. It's a full-time job. It's a very demanding job. This is a very difficult project. Really hard. Uh, because you go to places most people don't go. Shooting galleries, neighborhoods that are in a turf war with other neighborhoods. Uh, for drug, you know, this is a drug economy. So a lot of things that you see in, in, in this area that are actually working are related to, to drug one. Uh, my name is Roberto Badi, and I'm the field ethnographer for VAS, Vida Acción y Salud here in, in Puerto Rico. I started like 20 years ago in Uruguay. Uh, I did the first uh, ethnographic study of how injectors of cocaine in, in my hometown, Montevideo, understood the risk of HIV transmission. I wanted to know how much they knew and how much they cared. And I did that in part because my own sister, my uh, older sister, Cecilia, she was a drug user, heavy cocaine user, injector. Possibly early 90s when she got an HIV diagnosis. So, you know, just going through that as a, as a family, as a brother. We are sitting in an old uh, school that was abandoned eight years ago. This is just one drug from our office. Uh, it's a very well-known uh, shooting spot. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, we found that, we found it like the first day we came here. So if we found it the first day we came here, I think everybody knows it's here. When we walk through the rooms, we find the usual paraphernalia. You know, uh, the cooker, you know, sometimes it's a small can, uh, Coke, soda. They just half it and uh, they use it as a cooker. Uh, you, you can find in the rooms also the needle, used needles, the syringes, you know, in Sweden, you can go to a room, walk in as a drug user and get everything you need, very clean, very friendly environment, the water is running, you get your, your shot, that's a safe environment for, for, for injectors. Uh, an environment like this is a waste. Some of the people that are shooting in these school grounds were former students. People that eventually came here, or people that should have been here and dropped out. So it's a failure as a school, but also it's a, fa it's a failure as a shooting gallery. Uh, people are not supposed to shoot safely in this environment. A drug user has a, a, a family, has a community. They're going to go back. They're going to have sexual intercourse with wives and girlfriends and boyfriends. And uh, so taking care of the injector users, which are the people which are the most impoverished and more vulnerable, takes care of everybody. They, I think we'll be, a, we'll be a better society the day we understand that and pay for it.
Okay, so what did we find? So in the sociometric interviews, we asked people for their last 30-day co-use networks. When we aggregated those together, uh, you can see it here. There were four to five different community cores. This is basically 315 people from the first set of interviews. And as I mentioned above, uh, this was co-use, could involve any kind of thing uh, that involved uh, using drugs together. So it could have been just pe two people sitting together, each doing their own thing, Or, but very often, I think about 70% of the time, it involved sharing of some kind of equipment uh, and occasionally uh, some actual uh, syringe sharing. Um, but as I talked about, that's a little bit less uh, clear. Um, and then we started to, to so this is uh, taking a look at actual syringe sharing itself. Um, this is that same network sort of um, spun up a little. And the question that's being asked here um, was, um, who, uh, who have you used a needle after uh, in the last 30 days? It's color coded by location. So you can see where the bulk of the syringe sharing was taking place. Where there's a bi-directional arrow, you can probably figure there was fairly frequent ex uh, syringe exchange going on. Uh, and as you can see, some there are some really uh, sort of straightforward core groups of, of uh, sharers in, this, in some of these locations. Um, so we did some modeling, and I think I, I think I showed preliminary results of this the last time I talked to this group. The paper has since been uh, finished, and um, we used a kind of modeling that's called exponential random graph modeling. Basically, this is a special modeling technique. It's a lot like a it, it produces results a lot like a regression analysis, but um, it has to be done a little bit differently in the network world uh, because you don't have um, independence of observation in a network. Obviously, if I have a tie with you, and then you have a tie with me, and so your network is not independent of my network. And so because of that, we can't use ordinary kinds of regression analysis. We have to do these other kinds of things. And I would just, uh, I'll, I'll, I can walk you through this uh, process a little bit, but basically what the model does, the first base model just looks at what's the likelihood if we picked any two random people that there would be a risk uh, that there would be a syringe exchange um, relationship between them. And, um, and how does that uh, change? You can see the coefficients here. Uh, obviously, negative means it would be less likely, and positive is that it's more likely that there would be a risk relationship based on these factors. And so model one is the baseline. Model two adds the mutuality term. Um, the mutuality term just says, is there, are you more likely to uh, use a needle after me if I have used a needle after you? And as you can see, the coefficient on that is quite large. Um, and then we added a series of triangular terms. Do we find clustering of folks, um, groups of two or three? Um, and that was positive, but less likely. So, um, and if the, the sort of one other thing that kind of jumps out on this is node match location four. That just said there was in one particular area uh, of one particular location, there was quite a bit of syringe, uh, syringe uh, co uh, um, um, needle sharing going on. And so that one location uh, was a factor that we had to control for. So what does this do when we translate it into an odds ratio? And again, this is going back to the back to the model that we were just talking about. Um, as you can see uh, in the graph on the right, on model predictions, the baseline kind of um, likelihood of a tie based on how frequently you inject is actually uh, fairly low. Um, uh, between any two random people, it's very unlikely any two random people in the network that they shared a needle on any particular uh, occasion. What increases that likelihood is if they are potentially in a triangle or in a double triangle, or of course the very top line is the mutuality. If someone, if you've used a needle after someone, the odds of you of them using a needle after you goes way up. Um, and so, I think you can see that in the model estimate on the left as well, the mutuality clause, the, uh, uh, the mutuality term is there. And you can see that the odds ratio um, is literally 300 times the, the, the baseline. 
So what does this mean and what, how do we look at it? What we wanted to know um, in, in, from the statistical point of view was whether or not folks were understanding in, in risk in the context of, of, um, of using. And they could do that in two possible ways. One is they would not use a needle after someone that they thought or knew to be HIV or hepatitis C positive. And the second was, would they act altruistically and not have someone use a needle after they had used it when they are HIV positive, right? So one would be an outgoing arrow and one would be um, a, a testing an incoming arrow. Um, and when we did those analyses um, in, the, in the models that we showed you above, um, basically the odds ratio showed us, as you can see here, that no, uh, people are not acting to either protect themselves from folks who are HIV positive or hepatitis C positive uh, or to acting to protect others. Um, so uh, both, both results, here's the hepatitis C version of the same study. And as you can see, um, because hepatitis C rates were so much higher, uh, the, the, the odds are uh, not only sort of neutral, but basically you almost were inevitably using after or someone was using after you. Um, and so basically this, this sort of told us that people are not using disease status in, in, um, in, in uh, the disease status and knowledge of their own disease status is not uh, affecting their needle sharing behavior. Um, and that raised the question of why. And so we, as I mentioned, we did a lot of ethnographic work. We did photo voice projects. We brought people in to talk to us about drug use. We gave them cameras so that they could show us their lives. We did focal follows. We, we met families and so on. And this was a three-year project and, and probably among the more in-depth ethnographic uh, drug use projects um, that we know of. The photo, we did a art display actually in the community afterwards where we displayed the photos of the folks who we worked with. Um, we gave them, these were self portraits. This was the idea of one of our people that we worked with. They actually wanted to do portraits of themselves with a message. Um, and this was actually what we did. We did this with the whole group that was, it was a uh, participant led. And we had, a, we actually had an art show in the center of town um, as part of an effort to try and uh, destigmatize some of this. Um, uh, this science says basically it's not easy. Uh, you know, he's talking about drugs. It takes everything and, and leaves nothing. Uh, but I still have my parents, which was a common sentiment. So what, what happened? So when we, when we sort of stepped back at the end of the study, we had these sociometric um, interviews that we had done that we've been doing all the statistical analysis on, like the ones I just talked about. And then we had the, all of this ethnographic stuff. So we asked our ethnographers to sit down and draw out what they saw as the, as the co-use and needle sharing uh, networks and um, without the knowledge of what we had from the interviews. Uh, they literally just sat down and talked about all the people they had worked with um, and who was connected to who and how. And that gave us, as you can see on the left, an ethnographic network. Um, and then uh, B is the sociometric network that we were talking about above, which was from the baseline interviews, the NHBS-like interviews. Um, and then we sort of did an analysis where we said, okay, well, they, the ethnographers didn't work with every single person. So when we took out the folks that really didn't come into their uh, connections, we found actually a ton of similarities between the ethnographic network and the sociometric network, which, um, which gave us a lot of confidence that the ethnography that we were doing was very, uh, was very close to what we were finding in the interviews and vice versa. So it was a nice validation exercise, but it also made us feel like the information we were gathering from people in the ethnographic interviews um, could really tell us something about the actual data that we were finding in the sociometric network, right? If they, if they had looked really different, you could say, well, yeah, you talk to people, but somehow they're talking about something different than what you measured over there. So how close were these networks? Um, as you can see here, we had only three individuals that appeared in the ethnographic network that didn't appear in the others. And there was a high degree of overlapping connections. When our ethnographers just sat down and said, who hangs with who, who shares needles with who, who uses with who, um, they produced about 79% of the same ties that we had gotten 
uh, from from the uh, from the interviews, the sociometric interviews with those with those same folks. So um, so it worked pretty well, and the networks uh, the network uh, structure itself was highly correlated um, with a, with a pretty good p value, and so we were we were pretty excited by this finding that we felt like we were really we had managed to get two really different snapshots on the same thing. Um, and again, here you can see sort of these are just some um, comparisons between the two, uh, the observed network in the sociometric uh, interviews in the purple and the green was the ethnographic networks. And again, the high degree of correlation, if we looked at the complete networks as well, uh, the subset of networks was slightly different. The ethnographers um, tended to have see less taught, see, see uh, miss some of the ties that we found out from talking to people directly. So, um, and I'll, I'll leave this, I can share these uh, slides. I'm happy to share these slides, Stephen, and, and folks can read this a little bit more. This was a summary on the overall alignment. We felt like we really uh, were happy uh, about, about that. So I won't dwell on that. I've already talked about it enough. But one of the things that was the key finding from the ethnographic networks that you could never have found in the sociometric networks was this practice that people called caballo. And caballo is a term, it means horse. Um, it was sometimes used in the old days for uh, hitching a ride to up. Um, but what they use the term for in the PWID community in, in rural Puerto Rico is for folks who will go in together to purchase drugs. And, and part of the rationale for this is that the preferred drug of choice is a speedball, which is a mixture of heroin and cocaine. Um, and uh, there's some description here of how that works. They tend to put more heroin than cocaine in, but we had very, very few people who were just cocaine users or just heroin users. Um, and um, the rationale for this preference, I, uh, it, I'll talk about a little bit more, but basically um, what folks told us was that, the, that the, the addiction to heroin meant that you had to, um, that you had to uh, be, that you had to regularly use heroin to uh, avoid withdrawal and that you used cocaine with it so that the heroin didn't make you so sleepy that you couldn't hustle your next dose. Um, if you weren't, if you if you were a pure heroin user and it made you non-functional for that much time, um, then you wouldn't be able to to raise enough money in the intervening period to avoid withdrawal. So the use of cocaine along with heroin was meant as a way of mitigating the effects of the heroin, um, leaving people functional enough to be able to. Um, uh, to continue to, to hustle. So um, how did it work? Uh, whoops, I think I wanted to say one more thing about that. Um, the other thing about Caballo that made it such a, a, an important factor for risk is that generally when people share um, uh, in this way, one, they'll buy a, a, one bag of heroin, uh, two bags of heroin, one bag of cocaine, cocaine, and they'll mix it together in a cooker, you know, dissolve it in water, heat it up, uh, and then strain it through a, uh, a through a piece of cotton in order to make sure that the that both folks are getting their share they generally um, will pull the, the the drug from the preparation into the syringe in a single syringe and then they pull the back out of the uh, other person's syringe and they shoot the they squirt the the drug mixture back into the empty syringe so that they can measure them side by side and see that each person is getting an equal dose, but what it means is that the drugs in this in one user's syringe have already been in the syringe of the other user. Um, so, so how does that how does that work? So, yeah, uh, so we saw a number of social factors affecting this. Um, again, withdrawal was a big factor, uh, but also not having enough money dictated that folks would necessarily share or cooperate. Uh, in this way, um, and that it wasn't a matter of necessarily of choice. Um, most people told us that uh, they would prefer to avoid doing caballo if they could, but, um, but that, that just wasn't within their financial reach. Um, and we also noted that certain other factors 
uh, affected the way Caballo was done. For example, the person who brought more money to the relationship usually was the one who did the preparation, did the, you know, did the cooker, their needle was the one that was used first. So if you had less money going in, um, it was more likely that you were going to be using drugs even in your own syringe that had already been in the syringe of someone else. And if that person was not working with a brand new syringe, then obviously um, you are working with a with a used syringe. So you may not be uh, using the same needle in your arm, but you're in essence uh, doing almost uh, a kind of uh, implicit needle sharing. And this, this practice is referred to in the field as backloading. So here's Josephine, uh, one, of our, one of our folks talking to us about how, uh, how it worked. And, and then below is sort of a summary of how people talked about being sick, which was their version of heroin, their description of heroin withdrawal. And um, it's, a, it's a, by all accounts, a, a totally brutal process that actually gets worse as you go. So it doesn't just sort of hit you at once, it's a growing thing. And so people will, uh, will uh, do all kinds of things to avoid it, including especially caballo. Um, we found two different, uh, and this is probably more detail that I need to go into at this point because we're almost out of time, but we did find that there were different strategies, fixers were people who usually just stayed within their own group and that was their own term. Um, and maximizers was our term to contrast with it for folks who, um, who looked more broadly for Caballo partners. And of course, again, uh, these are all factors that have a really big impact on risk. If you know the people uh, that you're sharing with, you're more likely to know who may or may not be HIV positive or hepatitis C positive. Um, and uh, if you're working with strangers, then you don't have that, presumably have that knowledge. One of the things that was interesting for us was that folks who had wider Cabayo networks, it did correlate with uh, folks who had uh, been out of the country or been in treatment or been in jail. Um, and that was because they knew a lot of a lot of a, a lot more uh, fellow drug users by virtue of jail drug treatment um, and uh, and migration, which actually increased a person's drug use network size and increased their risk network size. So I think all of this together, when we look for terms to try and sum up what we what we're what we're talking about, um, uh, we like to use the term, the Merrill Singer's term or Tim Rhodes's term for syndemic, that is, um, that is a disease uh, epidemic that is actually tied to very closely to social factors that are themselves the, you know, sort of um, feeding into the, um, the process of disease spread in some major kind of way. And of course, caballo is a practice, a behavior that's, that's feeding into it that's driven by, uh, we know by homelessness and uh, the interaction of, of, from what people tell us, of, uh, of withdrawal, fear of withdrawal, and, um, and an economic status. And the result is that we uh, find high levels of caballo um, encouraged uh, equipment sharing. And that is one of the main things that has uh, contributed to a nearly 80% hepatitis C uh, infection rate in the area. So um, I'll, I'll circulate these around. Basically, the, the, almost all of what I've talked about today was published in the last year and a half. Um, and some of it, I guess some of the earlier things that prompted some of these questions a bit earlier. And I think just about all of these are online. If you want to read about it in more detail, the Caballo article is in harm reduction and um, uh, some of the comparative stuff is in other places, but most of these are publicly available. And here's my team, um, who I was always really super excited uh, to work with. These were folks who really did uh, an amazing work. Uh, you know, Roberto wasn't kidding when he said he lived there for three years and worked, uh, you know, in the community as an ethnographer for three years. So he is near, he tells me, finishing a book on that experience that's going to be called Sick. Um, and it's a book that I'll just talk about the nature of addiction in Puerto Rico. So we're all kind of waiting for, he's, a, he's an assistant professor now. So we're really hoping that tenure will get a book out of him. So I said like a true administrator, I know. Um, and that's it, here's my team. Yeah, so thank you very much. Great, Kirk, thank you for an excellent presentation. Really, uh, really fascinating stuff. So. Um,
We are ready for Q&A. We have plenty of time, 13 minutes, and your former mentor, Sam Friedman, kicks off with a question of uh, <laughs> over the many years of your work in, in the location, I'm assuming it's Puerto Rico, what have been the major changes? Here's Sam. I didn't even know you were here. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, uh, I would have I would have said even more. Um, what have been the major changes? I think Sam, that's one of the big things. I think one of the things that we've seen come back is, you know, as you might guess, is fentanyl is playing a much larger role. Um, we were for a time early on seeing some um, uh, some um, animal tranquilizer mixed use that was kind of known around rural rural Puerto Rico for a while. That has actually seems to have dried up. But fentanyl is the big thing right now, and like it is in many places and causing the same harm. Um, we haven't seen methamphetamine that we've seen in other rural places in the United States. So cocaine is still the other half of the speedball. Um, Hurricane Maria, we have a couple of papers out. Roberto, um, Sam knows all of these people. This is an old New York crowd, but Roberto and team have, have done another study where they did a lot of um, follow-on work with folks who um, were in and out of treatment and um, who were trying to resume treatment post Maria. Maria was a really, it's hard to overestimate what a disruption of rural Puerto Rico that was. I mean, it was every system stopped functioning, including the medical system. And so folks, uh, um, but the drugs were back almost instantly. I mean, most of the, most of the drug distribution organizations cornered uh, gas stations and they basically took over gas stations so they would have gasoline to be able to continue to run drugs into the mountains. And so rural drug uh, availability returned faster than electricity or water or anything else. And I think that was a really tough time. So um, I would say that's some of the major changes. Like I said, Sam, I wish our project had shown that getting in there doing education and the art projects and all that kind of stuff had made a difference in either overdoses or, uh, uh, or even just treatment rates or any number of things that we see as really viable options in rural Puerto Rico, but we didn't, we didn't see that. Wish we had. Okay. Kirk, that that, that yeah. plants seed with me for future work. You know, we have three settings, the one you just described so well in Puerto Rico, the work that Stacy Sigmund's been doing in Vermont and Northern New England, and then uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. It'd be yeah. fun to see if we could um, think about some potential intervention research in, the, in those settings. Um, and then, and then even observational research, trying to you know keep rurality constant, but uh, you know learn about commonalities and differences across rural drug users in those three settings. Um, there's another question here from Sully Coleman, a uh, um, early career faculty member in the VCBH. Thank you for your presentation. Can you please explain informed altruism? How sure. Important is it? Yep. So um, informed altruism is what our term for a, a possible decision people could make not to allow someone to use a needle after they had used it if they knew their own mm. uh, status with either HIV positive or hepatitis C positive. So in other words, it would be a, I would prevent someone from using a syringe or needle after me um, because I knew my disease status. And so we should be able to see that statistically in the networks um, mm. and we didn't. So it's a, as opposed to a risk avoidance, which is me saying I'm not going to use a needle after someone because I know their disease status. There's sort of two, two sides of the same, uh, of the same image, of the same potential relationship. Yeah. You know, Kirk, I saw an interesting uh, thing in one of the um, um, videos you showed, there was a quote from Josephine about uh, sharing and Kabayu. Um, and the term she used was, you know, you put in $5, I'll put in $10, and we get our cocaine and heroin and we're cured. And yeah. I thought to myself, you know, cure, she has to be using that in terms of, you know, uh, drug withdrawal sickness. But it also reflects like how uh, much delayed discounting that how present focused they are, which yeah. is striking to use cured when you're putting yourself at risk for fatal disease and right. you know overdose and everything. So at a minimum, the, some research on where 
uh, biases in decision making and individual differences factor into this, you know, um, would be interesting, but but also intervention. But uh, what are your thoughts yeah. on um, on on that? You know, how present focused they are, you know, which makes it very difficult to intervene. I mean, that's actually what drives contingency management because you just need some immediate material reward to get any attention when you're competing with cocaine or heroin and people who are in withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these were, you know, a good chunk of the people that we were working with were using up to eight or 10 times a day. And that yeah. that's yeah. Not, not uncommon anywhere among heroin, heroin users. And it's probably... Um, and this was the pre, especially in the early phases of this pre-fentanyl when we were doing that that work, the cocaine, uh, the the heroin in rural Puerto Rico was bad. It was just lousy drugs um, by anyone's account. And so part of it was that um, people's dependency required more consistent uptake. Um, and people would tell us if we could get, if we had the money to get to, if I had the money to get to San Juan, I could, you know, I could get so much better and I could be cured. I could get enough to be cured for a day on the same amount of money, but I don't have the way to get there. I don't have the money to get to Stan one and still have the money for the, for the drugs that I would need. And so mm -hmm. just like you're talking about, there's this, they even know a lot of the alternatives. They just, those just weren't feasible. Right. You just knew they weren't going to last a two and a half hour bus ride that it might take to get to San Juan. I mean, two and a half hours of withdrawal is, but to them was not, not worth it. Um, Another question from yeah. Sam there. Um, Other studies that we do find a lot of altruism of this sort. I think you're right, Sam, and that's why we were asking it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sense of time. I mean, this is you know, I don't pretend that we got all the answers we wanted, and I and I'm really, I really do think we have just we have more data to mine in in the studies, um, um, but sense of time is such a, uh, an interesting thing, right? Steve, that's what you're talking about, well, sandwich is here. And, you know, this is the kind of thing anthropologists we used to do all the time, go to the Navajo reservation and talk to them about their sense of time. But I think this is a more immediate thing, but it's not less interesting and it's not less complicated, right? Than, yeah. than what we're talking about. Um, though uh, we see folks near to us, we assume that their motivations and everything are, are, are simply transparent to us. But I think, what you're pointing to and what Sam is pointing to are that um, folks who seem very familiar to us and very up close because of of this of the the life that they're living the stuff this the physical conditions of their addiction have a different cultural take on things as simple as sense of time so yeah, yeah absolutely and, and Sam's right we do see informed altruism in in other in other places um, yeah. we didn't find it statistically here fascinating. Yeah, because yeah. I, I would speculate you would find individual differences around biases in decision making in that those in those who show altruism and those who are, who do not. But I was curious, can you say a little bit more about what interventions you explored, uh, even though they didn't work, just to to have a sense of that. Um, so at the at the time, most of our inventions were on hepatitis C because that was the biggest risk. And we used a couple of sort of set interventions. Scott, I'd have to look it up. Um, Richard Garfin, Richard Garfin's intervention was called, I'm going to forget that there, there was a number of evidence-based um, interventions on the market at the time. So we tried, we tried one of those as a comparative set and it was a it was a 10 week education course that um, went around and um, that dealt with hepatitis C and incentivized and um, just didn't seem to catch yeah. on. Yeah. Um, we tried to do some community. So some of the syndemic idea is that some is that um, is that the, so, the social factors are actually driving some of the epidemic. Right. And so um, if you recognize that people are engaging in risk behaviors because they lack resources to do certain things, then how do you change that vision in the community? Um, mm -hmm. Because they knew what they didn't want to do. People, people told us if they could avoid it, they would avoid doing caballo, but they can't. So that part of that was um, our uh, our participants wanted to say people should understand that we that we know what we're going through. 
that people should understand. So that was when we went out and we did a we did a photo voice project. We we're like, okay, tell your story. And we brought down art students from Nebraska and who had never been to Puerto Rico and didn't know anything about drug use. And we worked and gave um, the folks that we were working with our participants cameras to shoot pictures of their lives and offered them some of the self portrait thing. And then we planned a whole art exhibit at Cedra which we did. And the idea was if we could, could we change the social conditions of drug use that seemed to be driving the marginality that was potentially driving some of this. And, you know, I put that one photo in there on purpose because he says, you know, I've lost everything, but not my parents, you know, and, you know, dr drugs, drugs take everything, he says, you know, um, they leave you nothing, um, but I still have my parents. And, um, and that was such a, you know, that was such a crucial, message uh, from people saying, you know, I have a support network, you know, and, um, and the community, I, I, I have a relationship with the community, and that's what they wanted uh, the folks to hear. And so that was, in, in our mind, that was a sort of a way of trying to do something different than our kind of some of the stock stuff, you know, like, how do you do something in the big picture of this? Um, we did that at the same time that we were trying the, the other interventions. So it was... Yeah, it was very frustrating, I would say, overall. You feel very, you can feel very helpless in this. I think folks like Sam have done this for 100 years. Okay. Folks like you have done this for a hundred, battled addiction for, for all these years. I mean, I, I, uh, I admire it because it's, you can really feel hopeless in a, in a place like that. So you know? I'm the eternal optimist. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I see an opportunity be. to uh, put, put our heads together, uh, you know, the teams together in Nebraska, Vermont, and Puerto Rico and see, you know, if we can come up with some other, some other um, possibilities in terms of the interventions. Absolutely. Um, and Roberto Abadi, who was in that video as the head ethnographer, is now a tenure line faculty member in Nebraska and is part of the COBRI uh, oh, out yeah. there. So yeah. he's the he can link all of those things. And we still have a team operating in uh, Puerto Rico. So uh, in a different town at this point, but at, at the same place. Excellent. All right. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much for your valuable time here and for such an excellent um, presentation. It's fascinating. Uh, my, my pleasure. A lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody in the audience, too. Um, yeah, it, it was wonderful, and uh, your participation is really appreciated. Bye-bye.